It's Monday, December 4th, and this is The National. Tonight, Chinese authorities block Canadian media during the Prime Minister's visit to Beijing. And that was just the first sign a potential trade deal is in trouble. It's Donald Trump's signature election promise, but what's really happening with the wall? We travel the route to find out. But we begin in Hamilton, Ontario, where friends and family of a good Samaritan killed Saturday are grappling with a disturbing question tonight. Would 19-year-old Yosef Al-Hasnawi still be alive if first responders had treated his injuries with more urgency? Police say he was trying to help an older stranger who was being accosted by two younger men. What happened next is unclear, but he was shot, and witnesses claim it was half an hour before paramedics took him to hospital. When we got there, we were so shocked. Everyone is standing there. The ambulance were there, okay? They should help him out. You know what I mean? They should do something. They left him on the ground, did not even respond like to him. They were laughing. Witnesses say paramedics downplayed Al Hasnawi's wounds, even suggested he was acting. In response, Hamilton's paramedic service says it has now launched an internal investigation. The, uh, the manner of his death was it was as a result of a gunshot. There's still much to be done uh, with respect to this investigation. As for the criminal investigation, police today charged one man, but they're still looking for the alleged shooter. Ron Charles spent the day in Hamilton speaking with people who witnessed these final moments. Uh, we have a big faith on the court. Amin Al-Tahir says the tightly knit Iraqi community in Hamilton is shaken by the shooting death of one of its brightest young hopes. I help to write that case uh, in, in any way I can. The community's grief over 19-year-old Youssef Al-Haznawi's death is compounded by the way witnesses say first responders treated him. We start yelling at the paramedic, please take him to the hospital. He said, no, he's okay. Al-Haznawi was not okay. Police say he was shot by one of two suspects Saturday night as he tried to intervene in an altercation near this Islamic center he and his family were attending. He noticed two suspects uh, somewhat accosting, um, what was described as sort of verbally, verbally harassing perhaps um, an, older, an older gentleman. Our victim took, took exception to that uh, interaction and uh, attempted to intervene by, uh, by calling out to the, the suspects. That drew the attention of the suspects over to our victim. Al-Tahir says he and Al-Haznawi's father ran to where the teenager lay on the street. He says they were shocked to find paramedics doubting the gravity of the young man's injuries. I heard them. They said he's acting and they laughing with each other. They laughing a situation like this and his father there and we are yelling at them and they are laughing. They say, no, see, he's nothing wrong. They try to, you know, make him stand up and he just fall on the ground. It's, it's unbelievable. Others who rushed over from the Islamic Center say it was more than 20 minutes before paramedics took Al-Haznawi to hospital. I was talking to him. He was breathing. He was fine. Okay, but they took too long. They took too long. You know what I mean? They were watching him. You're there to help him out, not to watch him. It's not a movie. <laughs> Tonight, as investigations continue into what happened before and after the shooting, Al Haznawi's family and community held prayers and remembered him. They are preparing to take this firstborn of five children back to Iraq for burial. Ron Charles, CBC News, Hamilton. And Rosie, another thing that's not quite clear, why Al Hasnawi was taken to one particular hospital, St. Joe's, instead of the regional trauma center, which was actually closer. Still lots of questions on that one, Adrian. Justin Trudeau is on the ground in Beijing, and the trip appears to not be going quite the way he had hoped. It was widely expected that the prime minister would announce in the Chinese capital the launch of Canada-China free trade talks. But that's not happening, at least not for now. <clears throat> Moving forward on a uh, trade agreement with China is uh, a big thing, not a small thing. Uh, Canadians understand uh, how uh, important it is to get it right. It was a tumultuous day all around in Beijing, but the signs the deal would not get done came almost right from the start. Katie Simpson has the story of what happened both in front and behind the cameras tonight. 
Before the Prime Minister's most important meeting of the day, there were clear signs of trouble ahead. Chinese authorities blocked a Canadian news group from recording a photo op with China's Premier. And when their discussion ran unexpectedly long, Chinese officials abruptly cancelled the planned leaders' news conference. Each leader would only read a statement. All signs both countries were not ready to celebrate taking trade talks to the next level. I'm pleased that we'll continue our exploratory discussions toward a comprehensive trade agreement between Canada and China. We believe that done properly, a trade agreement will benefit both countries. A government source with direct knowledge of the discussions tells CBC News one of the sticking points is that Canada won't compromise on its progressive proposals. Justin Trudeau has openly said trade deals with Canada must include labour standards, gender rights and environmental protections. Premier Li Keqiang acknowledged that China and Canada don't see eye to eye on issues like human rights and rule of law, but he didn't dismiss working together as long as there's mutual respect, adding this is the golden era of Canada-China relations. Canada's status as a G7 country is attractive to China, which is looking to build influence on the world stage. And it's that drive that will likely push these talks past this setback. We would be the first G7 uh, country uh, with which they would negotiate a free trade agreement. This would confirm that they are the new champion of globalization now that the U.S. is uh, retrenching. It's already Tuesday here in China, and it looks like Trudeau could be in for more difficult conversations today. Just a few kilometers from here, Trudeau is meeting with Canadian and Chinese business leaders who had wanted to see more progress on potential free trade talks during this visit. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Beijing. Trudeau didn't walk away exactly empty-handed from Monday's meetings with the Chinese Premier. The two leaders announced a deal to boost some key Canadian exports, canola, beef and pork. They also signed agreements on educational and climate change initiatives. Free tra trade talks or not, though, Canada has already caught the interest of China. Chinese en enterprises have poured about $45 billion into our economy over the last decade. That might seem like a huge number, but what in reality is the scale and scope of that Chinese investment right here? Canadians certainly believe China has influence. In one survey, Canadians estimated that China made up 25 percent of foreign direct investment into this country. In fact, that number is only about 3 percent. Some context, the UK makes up about 5 percent of investment here, and the US is at about 50. That's in part because of a longer economic relationship with Canada, but that could soon change because of the incredible growth of the Chinese economy. Within a decade, China will have the largest economy on the planet. And whether we like it or not, we have to learn to live with them. But China has restrictions that block Canadian investors from key industries. And while Canada does require Chinese investors pass national security tests, the reality experts say is that China has much more open access to our economy. It may change as the Chinese become more confident uh, that they can stay ahead without erecting all these barriers. The fact is, Canada needs China more than the other way around. Back, though, in this town, in Ottawa, a Liberal member of Parliament has called out a Conservative MP for making comments towards her that she says were sexual and humiliating. CBC's David Cochran has been tracking this story. Okay, David, walk people through what happened today. Yeah, Rosie, it's a strange one. I mean, just as the House of Commons was getting down to business today, Conservative MP James Bazan rose with a surprise apology that, at the time, went largely unnoticed. Earlier this year, I made an inappropriate and insensitive comment in the presence of the member from Longueuil, Charles Lemoyne. I have nothing but the greatest respect for this member and for this institution, and I sincerely apologize. Then nothing for four hours until Sherry Romanato made this statement right after question period. In May, the member from Selkirk Interlake Eastman publicly made inappropriate, humiliating and unwanted comments to me that were sexual in nature. These comments have caused me great stress and have negatively affected my work environment. Thank you. Well, that got attention, but it left a lot of questions. So Bazan issued a statement filling in the blank, saying this all started in May at a public event while posing for a picture with Romanato. While standing for the picture, he writes, I made an inappropriate and flippant comment by saying, this isn't my idea of a threesome, which was intended as a partisan comment about being in a photo with a Liberal member of caucus. 
Romanato filed a complaint and Parliament's chief human resources officer investigated and in August cleared Bazan of sexual harassment. Bazan took sensitivity training anyway. He apologized to Romanato in person and in writing and again today in the Commons despite being cleared. Is it true that the chief human resources officer said there was no case of sexual harassment? Romanato wouldn't offer any further explanation or answer any questions. So, David, lots of people probably wondering if these comments were made in May. Why is it just becoming public today? Well, it's because Romanato raised this in last week's private Liberal caucus meeting. We have multiple Liberal sources on this. She went to the caucus microphones and rather tearfully outlined exactly what had happened to her and explained the impact that it had on her ability to do her work as a member of Parliament. Well, the Conservatives got wind of this, and they presumed that this meant she was getting ready to go public with her mm -hmm. claims. So rather than be caught on the defensive, Bazan rose in the House of Commons this morning, apologized to her for the third time, this time, Rosie, in public and on politics' biggest stage. Okay, thanks for that, David. The CBC's yeah. David Cochran in Ottawa tonight. And Andrew, uh, still waiting to hear if uh, Sherry Romanato wants to tell us more about her part of this story. As you could tell, David tried his best, but no luck so far. Right, and unusual the way all of this yeah. came out, to be sure, yeah. Rosie. Well, meantime, halfway around the world, Yemen's two-year-old civil war could be about to take another dramatic turn after the death of the country's former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. He was killed today by members of the Houthi rebel movement. They cheered news of his death, even though they'd been his supporters until a dramatic falling out less than 48 hours ago. It seems certain Saleh's death will only exacerbate an already devastating war. We'll get to that threat in just a moment. But first, a bit more on who he was. His influence goes back decades. He rose to power in North Yemen in the 1960s, becoming its president in 1978. Just over a decade later, North and South Yemen became one, and Saleh seized overall control. As president, he allied himself with Saudi Arabia and the U.S., allowing U.S. airstrikes on al-Qaeda in Yemen in 2004. But in 2011, a national uprising inspired by the Arab Spring. It forced Saleh from office. To regain influence, he flipped sides, working with Saudi Arabia's enemies, the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. It worked. With Yemen's current president in self-imposed exile, Saleh wielded enormous influence on the ground until Saturday and a fatal misstep. <laughs> Saleh appeared to switch sides again by offering to negotiate with the Saudis. Houthi rebels saw it as a betrayal, and he was killed as he fled the capital. Margaret Evans looks at what it means for the country's politics and for its vast humanitarian crisis. An undignified end for Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former president who'd ruled Yemen with an iron fist for 33 years before joining forces with the rebels seeking to oust his replacement. A marriage of convenience that lasted barely three years. Saleh switched sides in Yemen's civil war over the weekend, turning on his Iranian-backed Houthi allies, who reportedly attacked his house in Sana, pursuing him as he fled. Saleh appeared to be reaching out to this man, Yemen's internationally recognized president, who fled the Houthis for Riyadh in 2015, backed by a Saudi-led coalition which has sent bombs raining down on rebel-held targets in Yemen with devastating effect on civilians. The importance of what happened today is that any hope for a political uh, peace uh, process, a political resolution, is now gone. And now uh, they have the Houthis have absolute control over, uh, over the capital, and they have absolute control over the north. Fighting in the country, in part a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, has already displaced an estimated three million people. We reached Johan Moy of CARE International by telephone in Sana. I've worked in Iraq and I've worked in Africa before. I've never seen a disaster coming our way that quickly and uh, in that enormity. Last month, the Saudi-led coalition tightened its blockade on rebel-held areas, increasing civilian suffering. <laughs> Cholera has swept the country and seven million people face the risk of starvation if assistance fails. Yemen is hollowed out and as fragile as the look worn on the faces of its people.
Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Another big international story we're following tonight, Russia's Winter Olympics dream. It all comes down to tomorrow. The International Olympic Committee is expected to decide if it will ban the country from Pyeongchang 2018 over allegations of systematic doping. But while the IOC prepares to make its case, Russian youngsters make theirs. <laughs> So these kids are taking part in a popular video campaign supporting Russia's national team. Their rallying cry, we want to go to the Olympics. And very soon, those young faces will either light up with joy or fall in profound disappointment. The call is supposed to, is supposed to come down in the early afternoon tomorrow. If the IOC bans Russia, it risks alienating one of the world's great powers. But if it doesn't, it risks alienating all of those who see Russia as a serial cheater. But what about Russia's own athletes, many of whom utterly reject any wrongdoing? Chris Brown met a prominent Russian skier who was banned and stripped of his medals after Sochi 2014 to talk about all of this. And they spoke at the site of a storied Winter Olympics where Russia dominated the medal count two decades ago. Maxim Velikjanin is a sporting hero in Russia, but not to the International Olympic Committee. It's labeled him a cheat and banned him from the Olympics for life. We caught up with him practicing in Lillehammer, Norway. He said he wanted to do an interview because he has nothing to hide. They talked about taking some kind of cocktail with alcohol. Well, I never drank anything like that. In the thought that some athlete would drink alcohol before a competition, that's just a fairy tale. By the FS. In fact, the IOC's report, compiled by Canadian professor Richard McLaren, said that steroid cocktail was meant to help endurance. <laughs> And scores of Russia's Olympic athletes, the Sochi Games, took it. The IOC says all of them had earlier provided the doping lab with clean urine samples, which were then switched for the dirty ones with the help of Russia's secret police and sports ministry. They didn't find any evidence, said Vilikjanin, that would prove 100% they were tampered with. He won two silvers in Sochi and was stripped of them both. The IOC is now set to rule whether any Russian athlete should be part of the next Olympics in South Korea. Most Russians are furious that their athletes could be prohibited from competing at the Winter Games. They agree that the cheating was wrong and that it shouldn't have happened, but they say a total ban. That smacks of politics. Russia's Kremlin-friendly talk shows have amplified their attack on the IOC. A ban would be tantamount to sporting murder, said this presenter. The vitriol has been especially harsh for the former doping lab director Grigory Rachenkov, the IOC's key witness, who's been labeled a traitor, mentally unbalanced and totally untrustworthy. Russia's longtime ski coach Oleg Perevozhikov told us that Rachenkov is taking revenge for being fired. When a cornered animal is mad, he's very scary. He can say whatever he wants. It's impossible to reconcile the claims of innocence from the athletes with the results of the doping investigation. Still, a total Olympic prohibition on all Russian athletes may be the least likely outcome. Perhaps more likely is banning the country's flag and anthem from the competition, which is why Vilek Janin is making one last appeal in the hopes of getting his ban overturned. Chris Brown, CBC News, Lillehammer, Norway. And what Chris specifically means by banning Russia's flag and anthem is this. The IOC could allow individually cleared Russian athletes to compete as independents. So should they win, no Russian anthem will play and no Russian flag will be raised. <clears throat> Head tonight on The National, they were promised the perfect pet, but the dog they adopted was far from it. So why aren't there any rules for animal rescue groups in BC? Artificial intelligence is everywhere, from our phones to our justice system. We'll ask the question, how do we really know AI is working in our favor? And Donald Trump promised a wall that will keep Americans safer. What Paul Hunter found when he traveled the proposed route. Hey. 
you step back, yep. please? Yep. Hey. There's either been a terrible breach in, in uh, communication between the CRA and the minister, or the minister has been expressing false information. On The National Tonight, diabetes advocates say they are being lied to about why hundreds of Canadians with type 1 diabetes are being denied a disability tax credit. It's something people get if they spend more than 14 hours a week on insulin therapy. But Diabetes Canada obtained an internal memo advising authorities to assume most people don't need 14 hours. So, no tax credit. The minister responsible insists there's been no official change in policy. Let's take you now to Washington, where this will be a busy week for Donald Trump. The U.S. Supreme Court is allowing his full travel ban to take effect. It means the Trump administration can enforce new travel restrictions on people from six predominantly Muslim countries. The exact rules vary from place to place, but for the most part, citizens of Chad, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen will be barred from entering the U.S. This could change yet again, though. There are still legal challenges in the works. Well, Donald Trump has given Roy Moore his full support, looking past the lingering accusations that he assaulted teen girls decades ago. Trump took to Twitter to encourage voters to back Moore in next week's Senate race in Alabama. Trump wants Moore's help in a number of key areas. Crime, illegal immigration, the border wall, the military. Plus, he's pro-life. And the stakes are high. Last week's trillion-dollar tax deal only cleared the Senate by a margin of 51 to 49. You don't know who they are. They could be a murderer. They could be a drug dealer. They could be a kidnapper. They could be anything. I mean, it's just stupid not to know who's coming across your borders. It's stupid. Donald Trump's promise of a wall to keep out Mexicans is slowly taking some sort of shape. Testing is underway on eight prototypes built in San Diego right at the border. And we're going to be looking to see if the wall prototypes meet the anti-scaling, anti-climbing, anti-digging, and also the safety of the Border Patrol agents, if, if it meets all those criteria. Every contractor hopes their idea will be the winner, but something is missing. The $1.8 billion Congress will have to approve to even start construction. Right now, Trump's divisive wall is mostly made of high hopes. We asked Paul Hunter to show us what really goes on at the border. For anyone who doubts Donald Trump when he talks about guarding against illegal immigrants who sneak into the U.S. from Mexico every single day, Four, five, 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 eight, four, five, consider the Rio Grande Riverbank here in the small town of Roma, Texas. They're spread out. Somewhere down there, in the thick of all this, U.S. Border Patrol agents have just spotted something. Right where I'm at, I'm talking to you, it's a cavern. Someone, maybe more, hiding deep in the reeds at River's Edge. Would you step back, please? Yes, yes. Hey. Soon enough, they're captured and handcuffed. Two men who just dared cross into America. The 11th and 12th illegal migrants found right here on this day by lunchtime. A place where there's no wall, no fence, just that river separating the U.S. from Mexico. At least, that's all there is for now. If Donald Trump has his way, one of these will be the kind of thing that'll soon change that border forever. Outside San Diego, they are the freshly minted prototypes for his long-promised border wall. Catching the eye already of Border Patrol agents kicking the tires, checking them out each with pros and cons.
Slight variations, but a key theme. All of them are imposing. All of them are meant to be high enough and tough enough to stop illegal border crossings into America. The winning design, still TBA. A few steps south of those prototypes, there is a wall in this part of Southern California. It's been in place for years. It's ramshackle. And repairs where migrants have cut their way through it are everywhere. 20 minutes to the west. And part of it even runs into the Pacific. And even on this day, here, it doesn't do its job. These three, now held by Border Patrol, told us they'd fled Gambia in April and had just now squeezed through the old fence right where the water meets the beach. Trump's wall, when and if it's ever built, is meant to stop all of it. But at what price? Back in Texas, a state rich in cross-border culture with its fast-growing Hispanic population, El Paso typifies the mounting opposition to Trump's wall. So who is that? That's, that's Border Patrol. That, that is the, uh, one of their helicopters. Because we're standing here near the border, they come out to check well, us out? Well, they, they do that, yes, because of that, and also they do that uh, in a regular way. Human rights activist Fernando Garcia took us just outside the city where there's been a wall for a decade and where Trump's plans to make it bigger and more imposing are met with resentment on both sides. That when Trump leaves, uh, they're going to tear down this wall Buenos and they're just going to put a fence so people will be able to come across. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. For millions of Hispanic Americans, Trump's bigger, stronger wall is little more than a big, ugly symbol. We're talking about hate and uh, we talk about, about issues of race and we're talking about xenophobia. That's what is the essence of this wall. Do you believe Latinos will rise up and register and vote and, and change the future of Texas because of this wall and because of immigration policy? I don't have any doubt that Latinos are going to be more active politically. And I do believe that this is going to be a major backlash, a political backlash. And though Trump talks about a wall, fact is that old fence stretches along a fair chunk of the border already. Even if, in parts, it can seem absurd. In some places, it just stops. Elsewhere, being often not quite on the actual border, it cuts through farmland. So they've left gaps to allow American farmers free passage within their own country. In yet other places, geography makes a wall seem needless, let alone problematic, not to mention unsightly. Imagine a giant wall nine meters high cutting through this vista. So when we look out there, I see those hills, that's Mexico, That's right? Mexico, actually it's Mexico 40 yards away from here. We've hiked through all this for an hour and a half and, and here we are, where's here, where are we? This is the Rio Grande and that's Mexico. That's Mexico right there? Right there, 20 feet away. Bill Addington's family has ranched here for generations. Trump's wall would cut through his land, block access to the river, slash the value of his property, and rip him apart. It really does break my heart that it's that Americans have come so far as to to be so much in fear, and some in some of them in hate against people that have been our neighbors here for a long time. Add more border patrol agents, he says, drones even, but not a wall. No way, no how. Building a wall over this against the will of the people that live here, 
such as me will come over my dead body, to be honest. Remember the town of Roma, where those migrants were caught in the bushes along the riverbank? Even here, there's opposition for Trump's wall. Here, abandoned life jackets, discarded clothing, and medicine left in the fanny pack for those who cross highlight migrants are a daily reality. But, say those who live here... They don't have weapons. They're, they don't come here trying to damage us. They have um, the American dream, and I don't think a wall will be enough to stop them from searching for a better life. They're not really bad people. They're just trying to make a living. You know, I mean, like, I just think that he should at least let them give him a chance for that. You know, like, I honestly think that it's, it's not really fair. Just up the river, the existing wall is left a kind of no man's land. This field is north of the border, but south of the fence. And it splits a Texas golf course from the rest of the state, where for all the naysayers we met, we found some who say to Trump one year later, legal immigrants are fine. Illegals, build that wall. You don't know who they are. They could be a murderer, they could be a drug dealer, they could be a kidnapper, they could be anything. I mean, it's just stupid not to know who's coming across your borders. It's stupid. You're a stupid country if you let that happen. Short answer on all of it, it's complicated. Go to the eastern edge of the border. This is Brownsville, Texas, some 3,000 kilometers from those prototypes in San Diego, and you can practically walk across the divide. But here, Everyone just kind of lives, as Mexicans and Americans always have, along the border. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Brownsville, Texas. Now, artists and activists couldn't resist turning those walls into their canvas. They used lights to project graffiti that mocks the whole idea of keeping people out. It's a crafty way to make a point, but sadly, it's actually out of step with global trends. You see, in 1989, there were only 16 border fences, according to research out of Quebec. Now, 70 borders have walls completed or under construction. And the building boom has been spurred on by 9-11, by the Arab Spring, and by the European migrant crisis. Still to come on The National tonight, the broken hearts of BC dog lovers. They adopted rescue pets that came from other countries and turned out to have, well, some baggage. And are we putting too much trust in artificial intelligence? If a machine is saying whether or not you get bail, if it says no, you go to jail. If that decision is made by a machine, we need to be profoundly careful. Artificial intelligence systems are going to be an extension of our brains, the same way cars are an extension of our legs. Well, Facebook has always been pretty bold about just how much artificial intelligence is actively organizing our lives. Machine brains are deciding who you see in your feed, which friends you should connect with, what you might want to spend your hard-earned cash on, even what world news you should know about. And yet, when was the last time you questioned that intelligence? Because if machines can have human-like intelligence, they can also have human-like flaws, which might become a problem as we allow machines to decide more and more things on our behalf. CBC technology reporter Matthew Braga explains. Today, you can find artificial intelligence in your phone, correcting your spelling, answering your questions, and showing you the best way to get to work. But AI is poised to help us make decisions that will have a much greater impact in our lives. There are judges using algorithms to decide who gets bail. You can find them used in healthcare and hiring and in schools. But there's still so much we don't know about how some of these AI systems work and why they make the decisions that they do. And some of the experts we spoke with want that to change. 
and we're seeing lots of evidence that left alone that these technologies can be really harmful. And I think it's really trying to make sure that we never lose sight that these are political, these are uh, social technologies that have widespread implications. Think of it this way. As decisions are increasingly being made for us by unseen and inscrutable algorithms, how do we know if those decisions are the right ones? How do we know if those decisions are both accurate and fair? Over the last year, few years, uh, civil society has gotten very concerned about the effects and impact of algorithmic systems, and particularly the risk of bias and all these other things. And so we have an increasing call to make systems uh, unbiased or more fair or more transparent. But one of the big challenges in the space is how do you actually do that in practice? These programs are increasingly making decisions that have real effects on human beings. If a machine is saying whether or not you get bail, if it says no, you go to jail. If that decision is made by a machine, we need to be profoundly careful to make sure that we can stand by the decisions they're making. Police, for example, in some places have been collecting and analyzing massive amounts of data in an attempt to anticipate future crimes. It's an emerging field called predictive policing and a focus of Brendan McPhail's privacy and surveillance research. So you're going to have more data about young black men or indigenous people or homeless people or the mentally ill, because those are the people that have the most contact with police. If that historical data is used to form the basis on a predictive policing system, um, then all of the sort of systemic kinds of bias that were built into the data bank are also going to be coming out the other end in the sort of predictions that the system can make. If there's such a risk of getting this wrong, what do people think we can gain by getting it right? Well, chances are I'm currently surrounded by people who have encountered some form of human bias when applying for a job. But at the recruitment startup Ideal, head scientist Jia Min believes that companies can use AI not only to help them pick better candidates, but be better at picking candidates as well. I did see a, um, a survey of, of people and they were asked, you know, how do you feel about an algorithm being used to hire? And the number one reason why people were for it was because they believe it uh, would be more fair and less biased than using humans. So, you know, that potential and that hope is there. So I think um, we have to show the outcomes and we have to show results in terms of sort of justifying their hope that there is actually a better way and this technology can lead us to some better outcomes. Sharad Goal, an assistant professor at Stanford University, has been thinking about these outcomes in the judicial system. Like Jia Min, he believes that AI actually has the potential to do a lot of good, but only if we're thinking critically about where we're using it, how we're using it, and the types of decisions we're asking it to make. My worry is that when we call algorithms biased, then it evokes this gut reaction that says, well, let's get rid of algorithms altogether. And my sense is this is an overreaction, that there, that many of the people that we're, that we're worried that algorithms are going to hurt, um, in fact, would be hurt even more if we just throw out the algorithm altogether. We all agree that we want to make better decisions. We want to make more equitable decisions. And algorithms have a role to play in that. I think that there really is an opportunity as we've had for technology since time eternal, to have these kind of conversations, to convene different stakeholders, to make sure that, that what we're doing and how we're building this new economy is working in everybody's benefit. And Matthew Braga joins us now. So, so Matt, how do you actually stamp out bias if uh, machines have to get their data from somewhere, right? And, and that's going to be us. Uh, I mean, it's certainly a tricky question. I mean, one area that a lot of people are looking at is the data. Um, where are we getting the data from? Uh, what sort of groups does the data depict? What data are we including? What are we leaving out? Uh, really thinking harder about how we're building these systems. And then what goes hand in hand with that as well is looking at the teams that are actually building these systems. Um, how diverse are these teams? Uh, are we accounting for, uh, you know, a range of genders, a range of backgrounds as well, to make sure that we're thinking uh, about all of the people that these systems are, are going to uh, affect. Right. So, so then can we actually get to a point where we can trust AI decision making? Because I think of humans, you know, we're, we're really good at making decisions on a case by case basis, even ignoring data when need be. So. Is AI going there? I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why people want to have these discussions now, right, before we get to that point, uh, so that we're actually thinking about how we're putting these systems together, and that's where a lot of the calls for sort of transparency come into it, for more scrutiny, uh, for just trying to get a better sense of how we're putting these systems together so that we can try to build them right now before they pervade all parts of our day-to-day -day lives. Well, it is a complex question, to be sure. Matthew Braga, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Andrew. And straight ahead on The National, the promise of a dream pet turns nasty for some dog owners in B.C. 
Sophie attacked Aubrey on a number of occasions. One time to the point where um, we had to take her to the vet, like she had a substantial skin wound. When you rescue a dog, you should be getting a safe, happy, healthy dog. And we had two of those things, but the healthy part, not so much. And I, you know, I just wish they would have offered a bit more help with that. Melissa Lloyd thought she was doing the right thing when she adopted a puppy, but tonight she's warning others about a Vancouver-based animal rescue society. It takes dogs from so-called kill shelters and adopts them out for hundreds of dollars. Now the company, though, is facing allegations. It doesn't properly vet the animals or potential foster families. And as Farah Morali tells us, they're not breaking the rules because there aren't any. This is Remington. He's a three-year-old American Staffordshire Terrier Playful, friendly, with lots of energy. He's come a long way. When we went to the foster home, the conditions were disgusting because there was a mattress in the middle of her living room. There's dogs all over the place, the doors wide open. There was pee and poo and dirty newspaper all over the floor. Melissa Loy knew she should have asked more questions, but she fell in love and adopted the dog anyway. Remington was brought to Canada by a group called Big and Small Rescue Society which says it brings in dogs from high-kill shelters in the U.S. and Mexico. It then adopts them out in B.C. for a fee of between $400 and $700. But over the past month, eight people, including a former coordinator, have contacted CBC News to raise concerns about the rescue group. Complaints range from dogs not being vetted and having behavioural issues to people who foster for the society not being adequately vetted. Sophie attacked Aubrey on a number of occasions. Christine Wickner adopted a four-year-old Chihuahua healer mix from Big and Small named Sophie after signing a contract that said she'd had enough time to assess the dog. She was advertised as, quote, the perfect package that gets along with other dogs. Sophie, be nice. But Wickner says the dog attacked her own dog three times, the third time seriously. She later took Sophie to the SPCA, which conducted a behavioral assessment. It found it would not have placed the dog in a home with other dogs. Wickner said she had no choice but to leave it there. We were very attached to Sophie. Um, but yeah, it was just frustrating. This Vancouver-based clinical animal behaviorist says there's nothing wrong with animal rescue groups importing dogs, but it's the Wild West because there aren't any rules the groups have to follow. She says there needs to be standards in place. We need to assess these dogs better before they um, are brought into Canada. And I also think there should be better disclosure to potential adopters. As for Big and Small, it issued this statement, which in part says, Big and Small Rescue, always and without exception, puts the needs of the animals first. And without our support, hundreds of animals a year would likely suffer, perish or be euthanized. Remington is now healthy and normal after much training. But Loin says her story should serve as a cautionary tale. You feel like you're doing a good thing, you want to get the dog, and then everything else just kind of doesn't matter, right? And it's unfortunate because a lot of rescues are kind of banking on that. Farah Morelli, CBC News, Vancouver. Aw. Remember, you can go deeper on the stories of the day earlier in the day. Just subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash the national. We had, have concerns, we've acted on those concerns, and trained investigators are looking into that. On The National Tonight, Toronto police are investigating their own officers following a complaint about how they handled a missing persons report. The case revolves around a 22-year-old, Tess Ritchie, who was reported missing to police on November 25th. But her family tells us her own mother flew in from North Bay, and it was she who ultimately found Ritchie's body four days later and not far at all from where she was last seen. A group of veterans has lost a long legal battle with Ottawa over changes made in 2006 in how injured servicemen and women are compensated. Those vets wanted to sue, saying they're being shortchanged. But today, BC's Court of Appeal said the vets cannot launch a class action suit. Two of them spoke with CBC News after the ruling. This fight now has been something that's has become empowering for us and, and we've been uh, working hard to, to inspire everybody else out there to, to be out there, to be there for them at all times if they, they need to, to call somebody. It's been tough though. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there that are um, hinging on this case. 
Um, there's a lot of veterans with a high level of expectation that we are the hammer that will force the government to do the right thing by us. And that's so, why we can't stop. So this minor setback is just that, and we want to reassure all the veterans out there that this is, we view this as a minor setback. We're not going anywhere. Both men were injured in Afghanistan. Major Mark Campbell says there's no way he'll encourage his children to join the military after today's decision. The next step for the group, deciding whether to appeal to the Supreme Court. And Netflix confirmed today that its hit show House of Cards will go on, but without Kevin Spacey. The actor is being cut out of the final season after a series of sexual misconduct allegations were made against him. His co-star, Robin Wright, will reportedly be the lead actor in the final season. And before we go tonight, there is a little story that caught our eye out of Calgary about a big rock that is causing some big problems at a shopping complex. So take a look at this. People just keep hitting this thing. We have counted at least three different cars over this weekend alone that have smacked into this. An employee at the nearby Bottle Depot says that the rock was actually put there to prevent people from driving over the curb. And the company that owns a lot says it plans to remove the rock, but some people want it to stick around because it's such a hit. I said it. I said it. <laughs> and I have a lot of questions. Like, what were they planning on doing in the winter? If people keep hitting it, well, they can all see it. What's the plan for snow? Like neon, neon spray paint. I like to think I'm a good driver, but I am totally the person that hits that. Well, I, I'm on the other. I'm on the other side of the spectrum. I think you know, may, just maybe it's a good thing for there to be consequences if you're not looking where you're driving. But that, that, that so serious. Was... It's a All rock right. in a parking lot. Good night, everybody. That is the National for Monday, December 4th. Good, good night. Good night. <laughs>